back. Hi. Welcome, everybody, to Knock Knock Eye with Dr. Glockenflecken. I am Dr. Glockenflecken, also known as Will Flannery, but no one knows that name. That's uh, that. That's like I, I should legally change my name because uh, who is this Will Flannery guy? It's Dr. Glockenflecken. It's Dr. G. That's me. This is the episode, uh, the series of episodes where I get to talk about eyeballs unabashedly. I get to just nerd out on you guys about eyes. I am a board certified ophthalmologist, so I do know what I'm talking about here. Uh, and, um, and to be honest, where else are you going to get your eye knowledge from? I mean, come on. It's just, it's, uh, who's, uh, there, there's other ophthalmologists out there. Uh, uh, how many of them are crazy enough to want to do an entire podcast, uh, just about eyeballs? I don't know. Anyway, we're here. Let's talk. Um, uh, before we get into our, our case for today, our topic of discussion, uh, I want to just clear the air about insurance. Now, you all know I'm not the biggest fan of insurance. Uh, insurance companies are evil. Uh, we all know that. United Healthcare being the worst. But there's a lot of, of misconception regarding vision insurance versus medical insurance. What is that? Why does it exist? Should it exist? The short answer is no. It's it's silly. It it should not it, like it, the separating the two. It just it doesn't make any sense. Um, I mean, we can get into the history of vision insurance, uh, but I want you to actually listen to this episode. So we're, I'm just going to very briefly like explain the difference here. So people think that anything to do with eyeballs is vision vision insurance. That's not true. Okay. Everything I do, like 99% of what I do as an ophthalmologist, as a medical doctor uh, who went to med school and all this, 99% of what I do falls under medical insurance because I see when you, when things are wrong with your eyes, you have a disease or you have something we're following. You have diabetes. I'm checking for diabetic retinopathy. You have cataracts where I'm doing macular degeneration, whatever it is. That is all medical. That is your medical insurance. You have medical problems with your eyes. The eyes are a part of the body. So just like you would see a doctor for anything else wrong with you, you go see an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, eye bill medical. All right. So that's all medical insurance. It works just like everything else with medical insurance. Vision insurance is separate, and it is for glasses and contacts and a very cursory exam. So most of the time, uh, you would see an, an optometrist or an optometry office for uh, for vision exams. All right, now optometrist can see you when there's something wrong with your eyes. They're more than capable of evaluating you for retinal tears, retinal detachments, conjunctivitis. They're, and they're very good at evaluating for those things. Uh, but most of what they do uh, for your average ophthalmologist are, are vision exams. So um, they, they, they're great at um, doing a more thorough evaluation for uh, refraction. In fact, Honestly, like their optometrists are better at refracting than ophthalmologists. We don't do a lot of vision assessments, refractions, uh, 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 but that's that is really in an optometrist's wheelhouse. So, uh, if you want, if you're just wanting, you know, a, a pair of glasses, if you're just wanting uh, a contact lens evaluation, or if you have specialty contact lenses that you have to get made. Or, uh, uh, or you're wanting some kind of vision device. These are all things that fall under the purview more, uh, more so of an optometrist compared to an ophthalmologist. And, uh, and we work very well together because of that, because we, we have overlapping skill sets, but for the most part, we do different jobs. And, and so whenever you go and get a vision exam, so you have healthy eyes. You're just, you're wanting a prescription. They will do just a, 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 a basic eye exam, um, uh, to, to see if there's any issues going on with your eyes. 
and then give you a prescription for whatever it is, glasses or contacts, that will be billed under your vision insurance. All right, so it, it is separate from medical. I just want to clear that up because a lot of people don't know that. They think all eyeball stuff is all vision, but that's that's not the case. Okay, so let's get to our patient presentation for today. We have, I'm, I'm sticking with, uh, at least for another, for this episode, another very common thing. Because there's, there's a couple of the specific things that I think are interesting and that I think people should know about. Um, and so this patient is a 74-year-old woman who comes in with blurry vision. She hasn't had an eye exam in a few years and also is having a lot of trouble driving, particularly at night or when it's raining. She's having a lot of glare. She didn't use that word, but when I asked her, She's like, oh, yeah, it's exactly what's going on. I, it's horrible glare. I, I can't see. I can't see driving at night. Headlights are really bugging me, especially those blue headlights. You guys, I hear about blue headlights several times a day, every day. I mean, no one, I agree, those halogen lights, they're kind of harsh. And then whenever you have what we're talking about today, which are cataracts, it makes it so much worse because a cataract First of all, everybody over to the, over the age of sixty has cataracts. Everybody, they, it's 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 uh, it's as it's as certain as death. <laughs> you, if you are fortunate enough to live to the age of sixty, you will have cataracts. Everybody eventually, if you get old enough, you will get cataract surgery. It's the most commonly performed surgery in the U.S., probably around the world. Uh, and it's uh, um, uh, it, it's it's just a, a, a part of life, just like uh, presbyopia, losing the ability to read up close. That is a part of life as well. So uh, these things are just accepted. You're, it's going to happen eventually. But if you're over 60, you do have a little bit of cataract. That doesn't mean it's affecting your vision yet. You have cataract, but it takes a while. Cataracts progress very slowly. Now, I realize I'm just saying cataract, assuming all of you know what a cataract is. So let's talk about exactly what a cataract is. So you have your eyeball, and I'm so sorry. This would be a perfect use uh, for those watching on YouTube uh, for an eye model. <laughs> I don't have one, even though I told you a couple episodes ago that I would get one. I just, I just don't have it yet. I, I don't have an excuse. I just uh, I, I just forgot. I'm a forgetful person, you guys. I need lists. I need reminders. I need somebody sitting right there telling me like what to do. But a cataract refers to the lens that you're born with. So we're all born with a lens, just like a lens and a camera, like the one I'm looking at right now. We all have a lens. Uh, it's this amazing thing uh, that sits behind your iris. So the colored part of your eye, it's a surround thing right there. You see, you got green eyes, you got blue eyes, you got brown eyes. The lens sits right behind that. So when you're looking through someone's pupil, you are looking through their lens. That's where the lens is. It's right there. So the light comes in through the pupil, which is just a hole. It's just the center of the iris, right? It's the center where the iris is not. It's that hole. It goes right through there, right through the lens to the retina. When you have a cataract starting around the age of 50, that, that lens will start to cloud over. They'll start to get thicker and darker. It turns various shades of yellow and then brown and eventually black if you don't get the cataract removed. And it will, sorry, my dog is going crazy about someone. I think there's um, probably the neighbors living their life. My dog does not seem to enjoy that. They just... People are out there just going about their day, pissing off my dog for whatever reason. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's the life of a dog. What, I, what are you going to do? So anyway, uh, so disregard the, 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 I don't know how long he's going to go on like this. But um, so the light comes in. It gets the reason cataracts are, st are, so, are so frustrating for people is because as that lens, which when you're born, perfectly clear, absolutely clear. Uh, translucent. It just, the light comes in, it gets refracted by the lens, which allows you to see. Um, as the cataract develops and it gets darker and cloudier, then light that comes in through the lens is getting scattered 
by that cataract. So it's no longer able to just focus light onto the retina. Now you're getting some of it going off in different directions and it causes glare issues and it causes you just to not see well. It can cause your glasses prescription to change rather suddenly and become you become more nearsighted and it causes all kinds of problems. Trouble uh, or seeing fine print, just your the quality of your vision is no longer what it used to be. <laughs> I don't I think this I can tell like the type of barking from my dog. This is a squirrel barking. Like they they definitely he just looks out the window all day. And uh and I'm sure he's looking at either a cat or a squirrel and it's driving him nuts. All right. So, um so we've diagnosed the patient comes in We've diagnosed uh, the cataract. We've talked about the anatomy, so that's where it sits, and and it really causes lots of vision problems for people. And so the only way to fix cataract is surgery. Uh, you can't really fix it with glasses because it's not a glasses problem. That that cataract, that lens is cloudy. You just got to take it out and replace it with a new lens. So that's cataract surgery. This is the most common surgery I do. I do at least twelve every week. Uh, because again, everybody gets cataracts. You can imagine with an aging population, just how many cataract surgeries there are about, about 4 million cataract surgeries are performed in the U S every year, a ton of cataract surgery. I love it. It's great. It takes about eight minutes to do. There's various steps involved. Um, but it's quick and it's painless for the patient. You're awake during surgery, which always freaks people out. They're like, you're going to put me to sleep, right? Like, no, uh, it's only eight minutes. And we give you some uh, light sedation through an IV. Uh, we don't even have to do that. It's just to, to calm people down because you may be surprised that people get a little freaked out when they hear they're going to have eye surgery. So we give them a little light sedation, a little bit of Versed uh, to help them feel relaxed. And then topical numbing drops, it's painless. You get a light show, all right? I have people who grew up in the, in the sixties and of, uh, they say, Oh, I've seen this before. So, yeah, we get some, I get some nice little anecdotes about what it was like to take hallucinogenics back in the day or even recently. Uh, so, which is great. I mean, cause you know, people have a little verset in them. They're going to get a little loosened up and, uh, it's always kind of fun to have conversations while I'm operating on the eye. Uh, and so I'll take out that cataract through a series of steps. That part takes about four or five minutes. And then I will put that artificial lens in its place. I'm going to talk about uh, the different types of lenses in a second, but I wanted to give you a little history lesson first. And specifically, I'm going to tell you a little uh, interesting tidbit, historical uh, record about artificial lenses that go in your eye, what we call intraocular lenses. So you might ask yourself, how did they know that you could put a lens inside the eye? Well, this comes, this was, this was uh, discovered by accident actually. Uh, and so um, back in World War II, there was a, a, a British fighter pilot who was shot down. Now the fighter pilot survived. But what happened was when he was shot down, some of the fragments from the canopy, the plastic canopy, which was had uh, uh, um, a, a type of plastic called PMMA. I actually don't even remember what that's like, but it's a hard, really hard plastic. Some fragments of that plastic were embedded in this pilot's eye. And he was taken care of by an eye doctor. Uh, his name was Sir Harold Ridley. Sir Harold Ridley. Sir Harold Ridley noticed that, see, he knew from his training, it's like anytime something gets in the eye, a piece of metal, a piece of copper, most, any, most metals, they generate this dramatic, enormous inflammatory reaction. The eye does not like having foreign bodies in it most of the time. And so usually if something, like people have a metal working accident, you know, I've seen this a number of times. Uh, they're grinding metal in a high-speed projectile, a little fragment of metal gets into the eye, huge inflammatory reaction. You got to get it out as quickly as possible or the patient will go blind, all that stuff. 
But what he noticed, so Sir Harold Ridley knew that, what he noticed when this fighter pilot came in and had these, he could see these little pieces of plastic inside the eye. But the eye was quiet. It wasn't all red. There wasn't all this inflammation. There wasn't all these cells in there causing blindness and pain, just severe pain when you have intraocular inflammation. This wasn't happening with this fighter pilot, even though he had this foreign body in there. It's kind of interesting, right? So he, um, uh, he, he realized that whatever this thing was, whatever this, this, this plastic was, uh, it was, it was actually safe. He watched it. He kept watching it. The patient kept coming back. And at no point of in the treatment, in the ensuing weeks, did his eye develop an inflammatory reaction to this thing. So what he did was he, he took that same material that was made of the canopy of, of that fighter pilot's plane, and he formed a lens out of it. He made a lens based out of that material. PMMA, and that became the basis for modern cataract surgery, where we take the cataract out and replace it with an artificial lens. And for a long time, we used PMMA lenses. Those were the first lenses that were used. We're talking the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. They were very rigid lenses. So you couldn't bend them. You couldn't fold them. So you had to make a big, like six millimeter, we call that, that's big in ophthalmology, by the way, six millimeters is huge. So we make this big incision and we'd have to put this rigid lens in there and then put a bunch of sutures in the eye. Over the years, over the past two or three decades, we now have lenses that are bendable. We can fold them. We can fold them like a taco and inject them into the eye through a much smaller incision, about two millimeters. It's much smaller, even a sm- an incision that's so small, we don't even have to suture it. No sutures necessary during cataract surgery. We fold up that lens. We have a tiny little inserter. It goes right into the eye. We put it in kind of the middle of the eye behind the pupil in what we call a capsular bag that just holds the lens in place. And there you have it. That's that's the modern cataract surgery, all thanks to uh, uh, Sir Harold Ridley, who was a, a genius for recognizing that we could actually put a foreign body in the eye, and 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 did fine, and uh, and and now it's the one of the most successful things, uh, uh, success stories in medicine. Uh, and uh, you know, cataract worldwide is a huge problem still. It's a leading cause of blindness, and. Um, and 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 now we have something a way to, to treat it effectively and I'll give people back 2020 vision. Before we had these lenses, cataract surgery involved just taking out the, the cataract. And that's it. You took out the cataract because it was basically making people completely blind. And 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 then you take out the cataract and then what what are you left with? If you don't put an artificial lens in the eye, you're left with I don't know, count fingers vision, uh, maybe seeing the big E, the big letter on the chart, but usually not. So not great vision, but at least you could see something. But now we have these artificial lenses we put in the eye can restore you to 2015 vision. Fantastic. So that's the story of the first intraocular lens. So I mentioned we have different types of lenses we can put in. Now there's a dozen different companies they all make different types of lenses with different materials. There's acrylic plastic. There's silicone. You can still find, I think, maybe you still find PMMA lenses. I don't know. There's, there's, um, uh, I'd say acrylic and silicone are, are the two most commonly used materials because they're bendable. They're foldable, right? You can use a smaller incision. Recovery is much faster. You don't have to be in the hospital. Outpatient surgery, 10 minutes. Easy. Um, so as far as the, the materials, there's only a couple different options really, but the types of lenses, there's a whole bunch of different ones. So this is a conversation we have with patients with cataract surgery. So you can, we can decide what to do with that lens. 
as far as the outcome of your vision. So we can put a what we call a monofocal lens in there, just a, like a magnifying lens that has one single focal point. So I can make it to where that lens I'm putting in your eye after cataract surgery is in focus in the distance. Or I can make it in focus up close. But with that type of lens, you can't have both. Just one thing. Then you have to rely on glasses for everything else. Another option is called a toric lens. You may hear that term. That's a lens that goes inside your eye that also, it's like the monofocal lens. It just gives you one point, but it also corrects your astigmatism. Astigmatism just describes the shape of your cornea, the front part of the eye. Some people have astigmatism, some people don't. Um, or Honestly, everybody has a little bit of astigmatism. It's more of how much astigmatism you have. If you have a decent amount of astigmatism, it's going to cause blurriness that you can fix with glasses. Well, we can also fix it with special lenses that go inside the eye. And then there's also multifocal lenses, which are exactly what it sounds like. It gives you multiple focal lengths. So if someone's like, I hate glasses with a passion, I never want to wear them ever again. In fact, I go into CVS and I just uh, break all the glasses I can find that no one ever says that. But the point is they hate glasses. They want to do everything possible to not wear them. Then they can get a multifocal lens that is designed to get you out of glasses completely. It gives you several focal points, distance, intermediate computer vision, near vision. As you can imagine, you're like, well, why doesn't everybody choose that? Well, insurance doesn't cover that. So that has to be an out-of-pocket cost. It's like probably around 3000 per eye or something like that. Uh, and so, and there's different companies that do different things. But in general, when you have, you want that multifocality, it's going to cost you extra. But also, not everybody qualifies for it because you have to have a totally healthy eye exam with nothing else going on. And then there's this latest option that's called a light adjustable lens. Now, this is really cool. It's one of the, the most frustrating things in the world of ophthalmology, in the world of cataract surgery, is you, you, you put a lens, you choose a lens that's specific for your patient based on all the pre-op testing. We take measurements of the eye, the length of the eye, the shape of the eye. All of that allows us to find the right power for that lens to give them good distance vision or good reading vision, whatever the patient wanted. Um, and 96% of the time we are on target. We're like, the patient comes back, they see perfect for distance. They love their vision. It's great. But sometimes we're off. And it's important to remember in times like these that the eye is not a computer. It is the human body there is some degree of unpredictability that comes in medicine. And so as hard as we try to make sure we choose the perfect lens for a patient, sometimes we're a little bit off. And um, in comes the light adjustable lens. So before this lens was available, we'd put a lens in the eye and just kind of you know, trust our expertise, trust our measurements, and hope the patient, you know, turns out just fine. And 96% of the time, they do. Um, with a light adjustable lens, now you can put this special lens with this proprietary technology in the eye. And then after the surgery, you bring them back to your clinic. You can use this special UV light to actually change the shape of the lens after it's been implanted in the eye to, to like hone in on the target. So like say a patient wanted good distance vision and maybe they end up a little bit nearsighted. Well, they have a light adjustable lens. You can use UV light that this, that this is a special equipment you have in your clinic. And then, and then it, it activates something in the lens that that changes the shape of the lens to adjust it to give the patient the vision they want. So you can you can just improve it afterwards. And it's the only lens I'm aware of that does that. It is expensive. It's it's a lot of money. 
but um, uh, it's good for certain types of patients. So anyway, the point is of all this, there's lots of different options. It's a really exciting area of ophthalmology. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, definitely if you're going to have cataract surgery, talk to your doctor about, talk to your surgeon, you know, ask about these different types of things. They'll tell you all about it. They should tell you all about it. The other thing, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk about cataract surgery is because you might be hearing, depending on where you live, you might be, and if you listen to the radio or probably even, you know, watch commercials on TV, uh, you'll hear about refractive lens exchange. Now, I, in some ways, I have a bit of a problem with this procedure. So refractive lens exchange, and the reason it's marketed so much is because it's a cosmetic out-of-pocket procedure. What that is, it is, it is cataract surgery before you have a cataract. Okay? So let's say someone is very nearsighted. They're like a minus 10, minus 12, terrible vision. Uh, and they want better vision surgically, but maybe they're not a good candidate for LASIK because oftentimes you're not when you have a really strong prescription like that. Well, refractive lens exchange is another option. You're taking out the lens, even though it doesn't have a cataract, you're still just taking it out, and you're putting in one of these artificial lenses that will give you good distance vision. So you get the effect of LASIK, but it's a totally different procedure. Just it's a way to give you perfect vision without glasses. And it is a really good option for people in that situation who maybe don't have other options uh, and and just want better vision. I, I it, It's totally great. I've done it for patients like that because I can do it. It's just cataract surgery, but you don't have a cataract. So insurance doesn't cover it. So it's out of pocket. The problem is I have seen people come in who have had this procedure done elsewhere who are in their mid-60s. I had someone who was 70 years old who was talked into a refractive lens exchange. But they have, I've already, we've, already, uh, we've already talked about the fact that you have cataracts after the age of 60. So this brings me to my don't do that eyeball tip of the week. The don't do that eyeball tip of the week Sponsored by, I don't have a sponsor for this. Sponsored by me. I just don't want you to do things like this. If you're over the age of 60, do not get a refractive lens exchange. Don't do it. All right? you, it honestly, you are so close to just qualifying for cataract surgery from a medical insurance standpoint that it, it makes more sense. You're going to save a whole lot of money if you just wait a little bit until you qualify for cataract surgery because you have cataracts. Refractive lens exchange is good for people who are not anywhere close to cataract surgery. People in their of uh, you know thirties, forties, even early fifties, who are going to have to wait years and years but want better vision. They're the ones that could really benefit from a refractive lens exchange. But I I do see some doctors you know probably taking a little bit of advantage of the situation and and charging people a lot of money for this surgery when they really, you know, insurance probably could have covered cataract surgery. So just be careful, especially because you're going to hear ads. I have people, my patients come in and ask me about all the time. What's this refractive lens exchange I heard on the radio? It's, that's what it is. That's what they're referring to. And it, it is a good surgery performed by good surgeons but um, it, it's, it's good for certain patients. Not everybody needs a refractive lens exchange. That's your don't do that eyeball tip of the week. Have a discerning ear when it comes to ads for surgical procedures. That's what I'm saying. All right. How are we doing? Let's see. How are we doing good? We're about 30 minutes in. All right. Let's, 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 let's get, uh, wrap this up a little bit. That was a, a very cursory like view of cataract surgery, by the way. Um, uh, we, we could, uh, that's like what I do. That's the most common surgery I do. So I could talk for a long time about cataracts. Um, but let's, uh, let's keep it light. Let's keep it light. Let's see what else, what else can I talk? I think we covered the basics. I think that's good. That's good. I love, I love cataract surgery. 
and and I think it's it's honestly what draws a lot of people into ophthalmology. That was the first surgery that I I saw in in med school. Whenever I decided, it was one of the things that like made me decide I want to do that because you have someone come in who's because of their cataracts, they're like they can barely read anything on the chart. They're debilitated. Uh, they're not driving, and you do a no joke six minute surgery. Seven minutes, eight minutes, less than ten minutes, and and they can function again, and within days they are doing everything they like to do in their life when they couldn't before. It's it's really it's there's so much satisfaction in 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 what you're able to do for patients that it just it's I never get tired of it. Um, it's, uh, people ask me, Hey, when are you going to quit your day job? When are you going to quit ophthalmology, quit medicine and start doing all just full time? You know, uh, we want you to do that because you'd be able to make so many more skits. <laughs> it's true. I would be able to film a lot more content, but there's a lot of reasons. But one of the big ones is I love doing cataract surgery. I love it. It helps people, people, it, 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 it it's it's just a wonderful thing to give to patients to have the ability to do, and I never get tired of it. So why would I quit doing it? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm I'm not I'm not anywhere close to thinking that I'm gonna quit medicine. But um, sometimes I do wish I only had one full time job instead of two. But you know, it's I can't give up either one. They're both such a big part of my life. All right. Here's your ophthalmology fun fact. This is a fact that I love to remind neurologists. I love it. I, neurologists and my ENT colleagues, my Odo, I'm oh, sorry, my otolaryngologist colleagues. I don't think they like ENT. Maybe they, maybe they don't care. I don't know. I might be making that up. All right. Here's your ophthalmology fun fact. Six out of 12 cranial nerves affect the eye in some way. I We take ownership of six of half of the cranial nerves. I mean, I think, I think that's impressive. Wouldn't you say, uh, Mr. Neurologist, is he up there? Where is he? He is up there. Um, uh, it's, it, it, it's, uh, so we got cranial nerve two. That's the optic nerve, obviously gives you your vision. Cranial nerve three. That's the oculomotor nerve. That's gonna, uh, that affects a lot of things. Your, uh, pupil, uh, it affects uh, a lot of the extraocular muscles, most of them, in fact, all but two. Uh, and then you have cranial nerve four, which is the superior oblique muscle, which I'll be honest, a bit of a stretch when we're like qualifying things for cranial nerves. Does it really need to have a cranial nerve dedicated to one muscle that no one outside of ophthalmology really knows what it does? You could make an argument, but I stand by it. Cranial nerve four, it's kind of a cool nerve. It's got a really long course. No one cares about that, though. Anyway, cranial nerve five, corneal sensation. Now, we can't, I do take credit for cranial nerve five, but a cranial nerve five does a lot of things uh, that are not ophthalmology related, but, uh, you know, I'm still going to take credit for it. Cranial nerve six, um, lateral rectus. Allows you to look out, look out. Look to the, uh, what we call abduction, ABD, abduction. That's cranial nerve six. I think a little bit more important than cranial nerve four in the, in my made up hierarchy of cranial nerves, I'd put six a little bit higher than four. Um, but, uh, uh, both very important. And then seven. Now people will, will make fun of me about this, but I do claim seven because of the effects it has on the orbicularis muscle. All right. Squeezing, uh, Eyelid closure is, or, is um, cranial nerve seven. So you notice people with Bell's palsy, they can't close their eye. And so they can sometimes get like lots of what we call lag ophthalmos uh, and then a severe dry eye. That becomes a, a problem. That's a, another topic we could talk about later. But so, so I, I, do, I do claim cranial nerve seven. So that's a total of six cranial nerves. I'm just saying like, neurologists great like you can have the 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 shoulder shrug muscle the one that turns your head uh what is that 11 i don't know you can have the tongue one no no well we get we get half of them what do you think about that huh let's hear it 
sound off in the comments. All right, let's start a cranial nerve war. I'm ready for it. All right. Who dominates cranial nerves? We do. That's all I'm saying. All right. And then the last thing we're going to we're going to finish up with uh, is the explain like a mate. And once again, my uh, my children are both at school. I'm recording this um, uh, while they're learning things, arithmetic. I don't know, whatever it all, whatever they learn. So I had them write down a question. And this actually comes from uh, my 11-year-old who, uh, first of all, I should explain this uh, this topic if you don't already know. Uh, it's either, I should say, like, explain like I'm a kid. Explain to a kid. We'll do that because sometimes it's an eight-year-old. Sometimes it's my 11-year-old. I have an eight and 11-year-old. This one's actually from, and, and this is when I, uh, wait, I take a question from them and try to explain it in terms that they would understand, that a kid would understand, uh, and all of you would understand. So the question today comes from my 11-year-old who heard me talking uh, about on the, on the prior episode and said, what does 2020 vision actually mean? That's a good question, isn't it? That's a good question because I always use these terms and I just like, of course, it's 2020, 2020 vision. Everyone knows what that is. But do we actually know what that is? So let me explain what 2020 vision is or 2040 or 2080. So 2020 means that if you see 2020, that means you can see at 20 feet what a person with normal vision should see at 20 feet, right? You have normal vision. That's what we expect. If you have 2040 vision, that means that you can see at 20 feet what someone with normal vision can see at 40 feet. So you're 2040. So at 20 feet, what you can see, someone with perfect vision, 2020 vision, they can see that same thing at 40 feet. If you have 2100 vision, that means you can see at 20 feet what someone with perfect vision can see at 100 feet. All right? So that gives you a sense for for just how bad the vision can be. Like 2200, that's the top. 2200 or 2400, that's the top line. You can see that at, if you have 2400 vision, you can see at 20 feet what someone with normal vision can see at 40. 400 feet, like over a a football field away. That gives you a sense for just how poor that vision can be. So anyway, there you go. That's the explanation. 2020. Now, if you're in the, for all my UK uh, listeners or people that use the metric system, uh, they have a different notation. It's like six, it's meters, right? So instead of 20 feet, they do six meters. So I'm not going to try to to do anything more with that. But uh, the, gen- the, the, the general idea is the same. So there you have it, 2020. Now you can explain that uh, to all your friends and family. That's all we got for Knock Knock I for today. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, thank you to my producers uh, and all the listeners. Uh, give me your feedback, please. Uh, send me uh, your, your comments, uh, your questions, your, your, your reviews. You can leave a review on, on anything, wherever you get your podcasts, on YouTube. I'm happy to read those. I love hearing that feedback. I try to improve things like this as we go, um, uh, and I'm happy to. Uh, so knock, knock. You can get knock, knock, hi. I almost said knock, 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 hi at human-content.com is the email where you can, you can uh, send me your thoughts. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I'm always looking for new ideas. I got a long list of topics that we're going to get to, uh, but uh, until then we'll see you next time. Have a good day.